أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا ونبينا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين Dear, brother, dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma ja'al ma naquluhu wa naf'aluhu khalisan li wajhika al-kareem. Tonight's topic and lesson is the lesson of sincerity and courage. Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam and his companions and the heroes of Karbala are a source of motivation and strength and power for many of us. Their remembrance gives us strength and power. That's why we see our brothers when they're going through a hardship, not a real hardship, يعني at gym or something, they call out, Ya Ali, Ya Abbas, Ya Hussein. Because we see them as a source of power. Because of what they went through, we see them as a motivational source for us. Like I have ma mentioned many times before, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when he started his revolution, he wasn't looking for worldly goals. He was just doing his taklif and his duty. He went to save Islam and to establish justice. That's why he said, لم إني لم أخرج أشرا ولا بطرا ولا ظالما ولا مفسدا إنما خرجت لطلب الإصلاح في أمة جدي. I never revolted in vain as a rebel or as a tyrant, but I rose seeking reformation. Actually, it's more accurate accurate to say renovation, not reformation. Renovation for the nation of my grandfather. I intended to enjoin the good and forbid evil to act according to the traditions of my grandfather and my father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. But there is one important point that we need to understand about the tyr tyrannical reign of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. We need to understand that Yazid was brutal and merciless. Yazid had no red lines. And we clearly see that in the event of Al-Harra. Waqa'at Al-Harra took place two years after Karbala. That event took place in Al-Madina. More than 10,000 people got killed, amongst them 80 from the companions of the Prophet and more than 700 people who memorized the Quran. After this event took place, that wasn't enough. Yani. After that took place, Yazid told his men that they can do whatever they want for three days in al Madina, without being held accountable for any of their actions and deeds. They raped the woman and stole the goods of the citizens. It is said that after nine months, 800 women gave birth, and these kids were known as Abna al Harra, the sons of al Harra. The question is, how could that take place in al Madina, Madina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? They say, the scholars mention in historical books, the, the reason for that was that the people of Medina, the heads, the leaders of, of the tribes of Medina, went to Al-Sham to meet Yazid, to see Yazid. So they saw his aimless play and his lahu and worldly efforts. And when they saw him in this state and they went back to al Madina, they told the people of Medina that we saw only lahu and abath from Yazid. When they knew that, when they found out about the state of Yazid and how he was behaving and acting, 
they drove the governor of Al-Madina out of town. And they say as a reaction to that, Al-Harra took place and Al-Harra happened. But this is not the real reason. Yazid was Khalifat al muslimin by name, but he had nothing to do with Islam. He didn't believe in the Prophet When Medina was mentioned, they would say al madina al tayyibah Yazid would say al madina al khabitha Yazid didn't believe in the Prophet. He did what he did in Al-Harra as a revenge for his grandfathers that were killed by the Prophet in Al-Badr. That's why he says, Layta ashyakhi bi badrin shahidu. I wish that my grandfathers could see what I did in Medina as a revenge for them. And he is the one who said, uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, la khabarun jaa wa la wahyun nazal. Nothing was revealed to the Prophet. So he didn't believe in any of that. That's why he had no red lines. He didn't care about anything. That's why when he ordered, uh, when he told his men to take allegiance from Imam al-Hussein, he said, if he doesn't give allegiance, kill Imam al-Hussein, even if he was at the Kaaba. So he didn't have any hurma to anyone or anything. And we see the difference between Yazid and Muawiyah. At the time of Yazid, no one dared to speak a word against Yazid. Whatever Yazid would say, everyone would just do. They wouldn't disobey Yazid. But during the time of Muawiyah, there were actually people who, who would speak out and say like their opinion and have their comments. But during the time of Yazid, no one dared to speak a word. That's why Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, in these circumstances, he knows who Yazid is, he knows that Yazid has no red lines, he rises and he tells the people that we have to do a revolution against Yazid. But no one was on the side of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. The big known uh, personalities in the Islamic world back then didn't say a word. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Zuhair, Ibn Zubair, Afwan, Ibn Umar, no one spoke a word. So if the elite back then didn't speak a word, they weren't ready to support Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, then how about the public? One of the scholars says that if these personalities stood on the side of Imam al-Hussein and gathered their people, then no one could have defeated Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Everything would have changed. However, regardless, Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam knew that no one's going to support him from these personalities, but this didn't change his intention in any way. It didn't affect his intention in any way. That's why we see Imam al-Hussein and his companions on the day of Ashura standing fearless, motivated in, in the face of the opposite army. And they were rushing into the battlefield. They were rushing to reach Shahada. This is the courage that we have to learn from Karbala. Regardless of how strong the opposite army is, you have to do your thing. This is the real courage, because we have a fake courage. Let me explain to you what I mean by fake courage. Masalan, you know how when dogs, when they, when they don't get close to each other, when they're still like apart and they become closer and the one sees the other one and they just go like this, you know, like, and they stare at each other. We have this amongst human beings too. You see two individuals or groups, they just walk by each other or pass by each other and then one of them looks at the other one and the other one looks back and they're like, what are you looking at? Do you have a problem? They just go, they make the move like dogs. And, well, what's your problem? This is fake courage. We don't want this type of courage. We want real courage in, in, in the face of the enemies. Sheikh Al-Wa'ili, Rahmatullah Ala, says the following. لو أن الحياة تبقى لحي لعددنا أضلان الشجعان وإذا لم يكن من الموت بد فَمِنَ الْعَارِ أَنْ تَعِيشَ جَبَانَ He says, Had immortality been offered to men, then the courageous from amongst us would have been the most foolish. If you were living forever, if you had eternal life, then it would be foolish to be courageous and risk your life. But, since you're not going to live forever, he says, yet if death is inevitable, 
then it is a disgrace to live as a coward. If you're going to die anyway, then don't be a coward. Be shuja, but have the real courage, not this fake courage. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. You know what makes Ashura so special is the sincerity that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and his companions had. Because they were alone in the desert. There was no coverage, social media coverage or TV. They were alone. No one was watching them. So they did what they did purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They didn't know that in a few years, in a few hundred years, their names will be mentioned on every member in the whole world. They did not know that. They did what they did purely for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And purely for Allah. And when I mention sincerity, I remember Al Sheikh Abbas al Qummi. You all know Al Sheikh Abbas al Qummi. He's the one that wrote Mafatih al Jinan. Because this man had sincerity. That's why his, his works. And his books, we find them in every house. Wherever you see the Quran Kareem, you see Mafatih al Jinan next to it. There's a story about Sheikh Abbas al Qummi and his book Manazil al Akhirah that he wrote, so we can know how sincere he was with his actions and deeds. It is said that when he wrote the book, he most likely didn't inform his environment that he wrote the book Manazil al Akhirah. So his father, We'll call him Abu Abbas. He used to go to the mosque and listen to the speaker holding a lecture. That speaker would teach the book Manazil al Akhir. And Hajbu Abbas really enjoyed these lectures. So when he went back home and he saw Sheikh Abbas, probably he didn't call him Sheikh Abbas, maybe he called him Abbas. He's like, Yeah, Abbas, why don't you write a book like this book that? the Sheikh teaches. Why don't you have lectures like this Sheikh that gives us lectures in the mosque? Hala, if my dad told me that, I'd probably tell him, and the Baba, it's my book, you know, the story is over. Sheikh Abbas, he wrote this book for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was, his intention was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he didn't tell his father that I wrote this book. He told him, inshallah, Baba, if you make dua for me, then inshallah in the future I'll be like this Sheikh giving lectures and holding speeches. The point is, Sheikh Abbas al Qummi had sincerity. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him all this tawfiq in his life and after his life. Actually, there's a story in this book, Manazil al Akhira, which is one of my favorite stories. It just came to my head. I don't know if you want, I can share this story with you. It has nothing to do with the su subject, but it's a really nice story. So if you want me to share it with you, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. Should I narrate it in Arabic or English? Who's for Arabic? صل على محمد وآل محمد. طب who's for English? صل على محمد وآل محمد. طب خلاص I'll just go with Arabic لكن. طب how about German? خلص. إن شاء الله in English. You for German? يا الله. طيب. Basically, the story says the following. This will be هلا life translation, okay? The story says the following. There was a small village, and the elderly people of that village had the gathering. They decided that whoever passes by our village, we will appoint him as our king and he would be ruling us for one year but we're not going to tell him that his time is limited we'll just tell him that we want you to be our king so then after a while the first passenger came through the village they invited him ahlo sahla come to our house there's a cup of shai they talked they had a talk and they told him we want you to be our king the traveler who passed by he had a small bag and he thought to himself, I'm getting an offer to be a king, why not accept it? Who doesn't like to be a king, innit? 
that's what the shabab taught me here, to be honest. طيب. So he accepted the offer. He was the king of the village. خلص, you can stop laughing. So he accepted the offer to be the king of the village. And he indeed was the king of the village. All the treasures were under his command, the army, the people, everything. He, was, he used to take baths in milk. You know, he's take a bath in milk and have good food, good drinks, fruits, everything. But after one year, the elderly came with the army and drove him out of the city empty-handed. And then the next pa uh, traveler passed by. Come in. They welcomed him, ahla wa sahla, come to our house, there's a cup of shai, we had, they had a talk, and they told him, we want you to be our king. Come on, he didn't give it much thought, he accepted the offer, he was the king, same thing, good food, good fruits, good drinks, take a bath in milk and everything. And then after one year, they came, drove him out of the city empty-handed. Same thing happened with the third, fourth, fifth traveler. Until one day, they passed by a traveler who was different. They invited him over, ahla wa a cup of shai, they had a talk. They told him, we want you to be our king for, we want you to be our king. He was different. He didn't accept the offer immediately. Because something was weird, like, why, why do they want me to be their king? So he requested uh, for him to give him a, like a bit of time to think about it, and he'll get back at them. They told him, it's okay, no problem. He went that night to look for the scholar of that village, the Saj of that village. When he found him, he told him, I have a question for you. The people, the elderly people are telling me that they want me to be their king, but why? What's going on? What is it? What do they want from me? Why are they giving me this offer? He told him, I don't know. He told him, please tell me, like, what is it? Just give me an information. He said, no, I won't tell you. He told him, Bil Abbas, tell me. He's like, okay, I'll give you one information. Only one information. I won't give you more than that. He said, okay. He told him, their offer is real. You will be their king. But after one year, they will drive you out of the city empty-handed. This is all I'm going to tell you. What you do is up to you. So he went and he was reflecting and thinking about it. The next day, he went and he accepted the offer. And he became the king. But he wasn't enjoying his time like the ones before him. He recruited one of the soldiers in the palace and he told him to take something every day from the palace and take it out of the city and store it, and store it in, a, in a place outside of the village. Gold, silver, money, anything that has value. So he was enjoying his time as a king, but not like the ones before him, like just heedless and careless. And then, after one year, he was in his bed sleeping. They came to took him, drive him out of the city, out of the village. But he knew that this was going to happen, so he was at rest. They came and drove him out of the city empty-handed too, just like the ones before him. But he had told the soldier that he recruited that you can follow us, see where they're gonna drop me off, and then you find me there and you take me to the place where I have my things stored throughout the year. So this is what he did. So he went and he found everything that he had saved throughout the year in that place. The story ends here, but we need to take the moral and the lesson from this story. The lesson of this story is that we, each and every one of us, we are the travelers. We pass by this village, which is the dunya. If we want to be like the first, second, and third traveler, we won't give it much thought, you know? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I living? We're just going to enjoy life, and then Azrael is going to come and be like, Ta Habibi, your time is up, and then you'll be put in your grave empty-handed. So we don't want to be like the first, second, and third traveler. We want to be like the other traveler that went and he had the question, why am I here? Why do they want me to be their king? So he went and he looked for the scholar and the sage. 
So we should go and look for the scholars and the sages and ask them, why are we living? What is our goal? And they will tell us that your time is limited, so you have to benefit from your time. You can still enjoy your time as a king and live a beautiful life, but just send something, recruit an angel to take a few good deeds so that you may find them when you get driven out of the city, of the village, of this dunya. So this is basically the more moral of the story. I'll translate it quickly. يعني. I hope it benefits you. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Let's get back to courage. Hello, we had to stop at Sheikh Abbas Al Qummi Station. There is an event, an outstanding event that took place in Karbala related to courage. There was a man in the army of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam who died. His wife told her son to go and fight with Imam Al Hussein. When Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam saw him, he told him that I don't allow you to go on the battlefield. Maybe your mother is not okay with this. He told him, but my mother sent me. He said, if your mother sent you, then it's fine. You can go to the battlefield. And he got killed. When they killed him, they took his head and threw it back to the mother. She, she took it from the ground and said, Ahsanta ya bunay. And then she herself went on the battlefield and killed two people. And then Imam Hussain alayhi salam ordered her to, co to come back. This is the courage that we need. This is real courage, not the fake courage. But there is one personality that you all know very well that didn't have this courage to do the right thing, to take the right decision. It's Umar bin Sa'ad. When I read how he became the leader of the army of Iraq, I was shocked. Allah, remember the story of Shurayh al-Qadi and his wrong decision, his fateful moment. Umar bin Sa'ad had even worse. Allah, I'll tell you how he became the leader of the army of Iraq. Umar bin Sa'ad, his father is Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. He was one of the companions of the Holy Prophet That's why he was known in the Islamic world and he had a name in the Islamic world. Umar bin Sa'ad was born in Medina, five years after Hijrah. So he had the similar age like Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So Umar bin Sa'ad was the childhood friend of Imam al Hussein. That's the first fact. So Umar bin Sa'ad and Imam al Hussein were childhood friends. They were raised together in Al Medina. And there is no doubt. The Umar bin Sa'ad remembers the Prophet He saw the Prophet. Because when the Prophet died, Umar bin Sa'ad was six years old. So there is no doubt that Umar bin Sa'ad saw the Prophet and he saw how the Prophet would treat Imam al Hussein salam and hug Imam al Hussein and kiss Imam al Hussein. There is no doubt in that. But Umar ibn Sa'ad had a dream. He wanted a ray. Mulk al ray. This is a location in Persia. And Ibn Ziyad had, uh, had given this position to Umar Ibn Sa'ad. He appointed him to be the governor of ar -Ray. So he was going to fulfill his dream. The thing is, before Umar Ibn Sa'ad went to ar -Ray, he took a stop at Al-Kufa. He went to Al-Kufa to check up on his belongings and his uh, things that he had. But he went to Kufa during the time where Imam al-Hussein was coming to Kufa. So when Ibn Ziyad found out that Umar ibn Sa'ad is in town, he told him, come to my palace. Umar ibn Sa'ad went to the palace. And Umar ibn Sa'ad was known as a strong, fearless warrior. So Ibn Ziyad told him, before you go to ar I have a mission for you. We need to sort out the issue of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and then you can go to ar -Ray. Before that, you can't go to ar -Ray. So it became a condition for Umar ibn Sa'ad to be the governor of ar -Ray. Imam al Hussein was a condition. So awal shi, you take care of Imam al Hussein and then you can go to ar -Ray. If you don't do this, then you can't go to ar -Ray. Umar ibn Sa'ad 
was shocked. Maybe he thought to himself, why did I go to Kufa now? Why does Imam al-Hussain have to come to Al-Kufa now? Why didn't I just go straight to Ar-Rai? Because he knew who Imam al-Hussain was and he knew who Yazid was. You know, when they talk about Umar ibn Sa'ad, they say he was memorizing the whole Quran. He was praying Salat al-Layl. So Umar ibn Sa'ad is facing a problem. What do I do? Should I leave ar ray which is my dream, and now I have it in my own hands? Or should I kill Imam al Hussein? He didn't know what to do. He didn't give an answer to Ibn Ziyad. He told him, just give me some time to reflect and think. Ibn Ziyad told him, you don't have much time. al Hussein is on his way. Because to Ibn Ziyad, he w didn't want to appoint anyone from Al-Kufa. Because he knew that the people of Kufa were calling Imam al-Hussain to come, and he, he feared that once they meet Imam al-Hussain in Karbala, that they might change the side. So he wanted Umar ibn Sa'ad, and he knew how much Umar ibn Sa'ad wanted to be the governor of ar -Ray. So Ibn Sa'ad Sa went home. He probably didn't sleep that night, because he was thinking, what should I do? What do I have to do? I can't kill Imam al-Hussain alayhi salam. I don't want to kill Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, but at the, same t at the same time, I'm so close to fulfilling my dream to have a ray in my hands. I can choose. I have it in my own hands. So what do I do? And here, Hadith and Nafs comes. Your own self starts talking to you. He woke up the next morning and he thought to himself that, okay, I will accept to lead the army of Iraq against Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So he went to Ibn Ziyad and he told him, okay, I accept. But he didn't have the intention to kill Imam al Hussein. He thought to himself, I will just convince Imam al Hussein in a way for him to pay allegiance. We will find another solution. I don't have to kill him necessarily. And it's not for sure that I have to kill Imam al Hussein. Maybe I can convince him. But I want Mulk al Ray. So then they went to Karbala. When they were in Karbala, Imam al Hussein and Umar ibn Sa'ad had a few talks. Umar ibn Sa'ad was trying to convince Imam al Hussein to pay allegiance and everything, but Imam al Hussein salam, insisted on his opinion. Also, Imam al Hussein salam, tried to convince Umar ibn Sa'ad. It is said that they met in the middle, in the middle of the battlefield, each one, and Umar ibn Sa'ad came with 20 men, Imam al Hussein salam, came with 20 men, and they met. And they were talking. But whatever Imam al Hussein would tell Umar ibn Sa'ad to convince him to change the side, to wake him up from his heedlessness, Umar ibn Sa'ad wouldn't listen. And then the ninth of Muharram came. Shimr had a message from Ibn Ziyad to Umar ibn Sa'ad. Because Ibn Ziyad was wondering, like, why, why, like, why are there no new, new events happening? What, what's going on? What are they doing in Karbala so long? So Ibn Ziyad had sent a message with Shimr that if Umar isn't going to start the fight, the battle, then I will remove him and appoint someone else. And here is the fateful moment of Umar ibn Sa'ad. He doesn't want to kill Imam al-Hussein because he said, He knows that it is a sin, it is a big mistake to kill Imam al-Hussein But his dream is a ray So he didn't have much time. It was the ninth of Muharram. Either he fights and kills Imam al-Hussein or he has to leave Mulk al -Ray. But he wasn't strong enough to take the right decision. And he chose to fight Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. That's why when we read the Maqtal on Tuesday, you will hear that he was the first one to shoot an arrow to the tents of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. And he told his men, Ishadu li and al Amir. I am the first one who threw an arrow at the opposite tents. We all have Umar ibn Sa'ad inside of us, we all have a shimmer inside of us. If we don't raise, if we don't do jihad and nafs the way we should and the way we have so that we leave our desires aside, then in our faithful moments, we won't take the right decision. Because sometimes you try to envision Umar ibn Sa'ad and these personalities as like just evil, mahad, pure evil. They didn't care. No, they knew that they were doing something wrong, but they weren't strong enough to take the right decision. That's why when Umar ibn Sa'ad returned, he said, Imla Rikabi Fuddatan Wadahaba inni Katal Tuhayran Nasi Umman Waaba. Reward me with 
gold and silver. I killed the one who has the best parents. He knows, but the love of his dunya was stronger than him. And this is what we need to learn from Karbala. Karbala isn't one battle. Karbala is a million battles. In each and every one, Al-Hur fought a million battles. Umar ibn Sa'ad, the companions of Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam. It wasn't easy. That's why we need to look at Ashura and learn from Ashura in a way that justice must dwell at any price. We learn from Ashura that the blood that is shed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always, always be victorious in the end. Assalamu ala Abi al-Fadl al-Abbas, the symbol of loyalty and courage. We all have a special relationship with Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Especially when we mention al-Abbas and Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. The poet says, Imam Ali alayhi salam, before they went to Karbala, during the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam, he looked at Zainab. And he told her, Ya Zainab, Anti khtari al-kafil. You choose your protector. She told him, Qalit la yabul hasnin, an khtar abu fadil. I want Abu Fadl as my protector. Imam Ali alayhi salam then turns to Abu Fadl al-Abbas and tells him, Ya Bunayya Abbas, Midli bil ajal yamnak, give me your right hand, O Abu Fadl. Urid o seek bewsiya, Wahalli fed aman o yak. I want to entrust you someone. لطفلو طلعت بيوم هاي الغالية بحماك If you ever go to Al-Taf When the day comes and you have to go to Al-Taf This dear one is in your protection O Abu Al-Fadl بكفك خلي كف زينب ودمع من الجفن سايل Leave your hand Leave her hand in your hand O Abu Al-Fadl Don't leave Zainab عليه السلام alone then Abu al-Fadl turns to Imam Ali alayhi salam and tells him, Ya Abu Yashti Wassini, what are you telling me? Ma ahtaj ana wasiya, bi'ayuni akhalliha, ma dam in nafas biya. I will protect Zainab alayhi salam as long as I breathe. I will protect Zainab. Tidri biha ya Abu ya, ikhti wa ghaliya alayya. She's my sister and very dear to my heart. Ahad minni ahamiha wub'ayn al-ahad shayif. But then Abu al-Fatl al-Abbas apologies from Imam Ali alayhi salam. He apologizes from Imam Ali alayhi salam. And he tells him, Lakin buya aridannak ta'adhurni wa tisamihni. Please forgive me, O Father. Why? Why should Imam Ali forgive you, Ya Abbas? He said, But if they cut off my hands on the 10th of Muharram, please don't blame me. But if they cut off my hands on the 10th of and then he tells him the following. الشمر ما يقرب الزينب إلا يكون ذا بحني Shimr will not come close to Zainab alayhi salam until he had beheaded me. I will not allow Shimr to come close to Zainab unless I am dead. الشمر ما يقرب الزينب إلا يكون ذا بحني وما يدنا للمخيم and he will not come close to the tents unless my flag falls on the ground. And then on the 10th of Muharram, when Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was at the river, and he called his brother al-Husayn, Akhi adrikni, Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam went to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, and he told him, Al-an in kasara dhahri. 
Now my back is broken, O oh Abu al-Fadl. When Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam wanted to take him to the tents, Abu al-Fadl told him, please don't take me to the tents. I don't want to go to the tents. He told him, but why? Why don't you want to go to the tents? He said, because I promised Sukaina that I will come back with water and I don't have any water. I don't want to go to the tents with no water. So he left them at the river.